fans. Can't live with him, can't live without him. On one hand, fans can be some of the most wonderfully creative and kind people out there cultivating welcoming and friendly fan bases. On the other hand, fans can be straight up unhinged. Everyone always talks about toxic fandoms, but statistically most fandoms will have a couple of bad apples that spoil the bunch and make everyone else look bad. One of these fandoms is that of Voltron Legendary Defender, an animated mecha series created by DreamWorks. The show became wildly popular and a huge online fan base quickly formed around it on sites like Twitter and Tumblr and needless to say, drama ensued. From glass cupcakes to death threats to a bizarre fan-made spin-off series, let's dive into the strange world of Voltron fandom drama. Before we get into things, I just want to give a huge thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes on every topic under the sun, from filmmaking to animation to illustration to health and fitness to photography to writing and everything in between. I've actually been developing an animation project for a while, so I've been taking Ira Mark's course Concept Art Drawing Imaginary Worlds. This course not only helps you understand the more technical aspects of drawing with perspective and depth, but really focuses in on world building and environmental details. Details. It's not just art and illustration though, if you can think of it there's probably a class for it from gardening to sewing to cooking and much more. Skillshare is also great if you want to start making YouTube videos because I do get a lot of questions about that and Skillshare has a ton of great classes on filmmaking, editing and creating cool content in general. The first 1000 subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of premium membership so you can start exploring thousands of fun and inspiring courses today. Super excited to be working with Skillshare, I genuinely love the class classes I've taken so far and the overall community in general so I can't wait to see you guys over there and we can do some learning together. Thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video and now let's get into the Voltron fandom drama. To discuss the many dramas within the community, we obviously need a little bit of context as to what Voltron is. Voltron Legendary Defender or VLD was actually the fourth show in the Voltron franchise being one of the many reboots slash adaptions of the original 1983 show which in and of itself was an adaption of several anime series. The original show focused on five space explorers as they piloted a giant robot called Voltron. It became a popular example of the Japanese mecha genre alongside other highly esteemed classics like Mobile Suit Gundam and Neon Genesis. Genesis Evangelion. Needless to say, Voltron was a bit on the lighter side. Neon Genesis Evangelion. <whistles> wow. It was a classic Saturday morning cartoon going on to become the top rated syndicated children's show during its run and one of the most well known and iconic franchises of its time. It received several subsequent shows including Voltron the Third Dimension in 1998 and Voltron Force in 2012. This is where our story begins, four years after Force ended, a new series was developed by DreamWorks called Voltron Legendary Defender. Legendary Defender was based on the original 1983 television show but modernized and adapted by DreamWorks. The basic plot synopsis is that the evil Galera Empire has been destroying civilizations across the galaxy and the only thing that can stop it is this big old space robot known as the Defender of the Universe or Voltron. Voltron has five pilots, also known as Paladins. Shiro, the leader, Keith, the edgy one, Lance, the smug and overconfident one, Pidge, the smart one, and Hunk, the big strong looking one with a heart of gold. These five are accompanied by Allura, an alien princess who is also a paladin herself. The plot follows these characters as they work together to defeat the Galera Empire and the evil Zarkon. The show maintained a pretty light and humorous tone at least at first but as the series went on it did begin to tackle some heavier plot lines with angst, relationship drama and violence though it was always pretty PG. The original Voltron series had always enjoyed a pretty large fan base, both because of its merit as a show and also for that nostalgia factor. There were books, toys, TV specials and merch aplenty so it was no surprise that upon release Legendary Defender quickly began to amass a large fan base. But it kinda just kept growing and growing and and growing far beyond the scope of what anyone involved in the project had originally expected. See, there's a strange phenomenon on the internet where Tumblr will find a piece of media and latch onto it. And that piece of media is usually completely random, from Sherlock to Undertale to the Lorax to Thomas Sanders. But once Tumblr gets involved, that fandom is guaranteed to grow exponentially to the point where it dwarfs the entire site and other corners of the internet as well. That's when messy fandom shenanigans often happen, and oh boy did this certainly happen with Voltron. So let's start getting into the various dramas that plagued the fandom, and yes, most of it is all based on shipping. Buckle in.
To understand why there was so much strife centered around the show, we first have to look at the state of the fandom and how whipped into a frenzy they got over shipping. We can attribute a lot of Voltron's success to its genuine high quality. It was met with critical acclaim from both critics and viewers, and multiple seasons even received 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. The show was also praised for its diverse cast. And while I'm sure this high quality did play a role in why Tumblr liked this show so much, they liked it for one main reason, the shippability of the cast. Pretty soon after it gained a following, large and intense shipping communities formed around the show, more specifically around the pairing of Keith and Lance, also known as Clance, as well as Shiro and Keith, known as Sheath. Now usually shipping is pretty harmless, you see some characters you like, you think they might look cute together, and maybe if you're super invested in the fandom you make some artwork or fan fiction or you share the love with other fans. Generally most fans will politely acknowledge the other ships in the fandom without freaking out, but really controlling an unhealthily intense investment in shipping became a big problem within the Voltron fandom. Fandom. The Sheath and Clant shippers were at war. Obviously, there was only one Keith, so there grew to be this really intense hatred between the two shipping groups since technically only one could become canon. Clant shippers were the majority, they were like basically the fandom's OTP, but other people really hated Clant and advocated for Sheath instead, which is really its own can of worms. Anyone who shipped Shiro, a man in his mid 20s with Keith, who according to the Paladin's Handbook, the Wiki, and pretty much every other source I can find is 18, was called the Naughty Predator. Word. Look, I'm not gonna say I don't personally find it really weird, but by all definitions it wasn't illegal. I am now going to have 300 DMs from Voltron shippers on both sides telling me to KMS. Don't share your thoughts on shipping online, worst mistake of my life. Anyway, a more serious point of contention were Shaladins, or people who shipped Shira with the other Paladin characters whose ages ranged from 15 to 17. They were also known as Shallies, which was like a derogatory term apparently. Obviously these shippers got a lot of hate since most of the paladins were minors, and this was adding on to like 10 million other fandom discourses already flying around. Hell, I know there's gonna be shipping discourse in the comments of this very video. If you want a fun activity, go down to the comments and tell me how many seconds it takes you to find people arguing over ships. And this isn't to imply that all fans were like this, many people were just casual fans of the show or didn't want to get involved in the drama, but there's no denying that the Voltron fandom gained a pretty negative reputation during this time. It was a pretty hostile and toxic place where publicly posting your thoughts on a ship could net you harassment and death threats and there was always a call outpost ready to go for the next outspoken fan who stepped out of line. Sheaths were all predators and incest supporters, Clances were all snowflake purity culture antis and anyone who tried to stay neutral would be destroyed from both sides. And this vitriol wasn't only directed at fellow fans but at the cast and crew at DreamWorks who faced waves of backlash and harassment over their involvement with the show. So Voltron was produced by DreamWorks, it had a pretty large crew of artists, animators, editors, voice actors and more. Unfortunately, many members of the crew would at some point face harassment from rabid fans. The showrunners and voice actors would receive the brunt of the abuse as they were the more well-known and public members of the crew. This never made sense to me, like why target the voice actors, they didn't write it, they're just doing a job. This harassment was likely amped up by the fact that many voice actors from the show were very active within the fandom, engaging with fans, liking memes and making posts about the characters. This added level of interactivity and parasociality made fans feel personally invested in these VAs to the point where they felt it okay to personally harass, threaten, and mock them. Bex Taylor Claus, the voice actor for Pidge, liked a post about Sheaf labeling one of the characters as a power bottom which started a flood of hate and death threats towards them. This culminated in a drama where they replied to a user who had been tagging them in hate posts by angrily cussing them out. It then turned out that the OP was a minor, causing Tumblr users to get into an uproar over the fact that Bex was bullying a 13 year old which then led to allegations that the 13 year old was being harassed en masse because of Bex which then led to a public apology which only angered the fandom further. In the wake of the season 7 release, Bex revealed that they had to consider cancelling con appearances due to safety concerns and they weren't the only VA affected. After Josh Keaton made a post defending Shallot and Ships, he received intense backlash which led to him issuing a statement on Tumblr that he would be stepping down from the community. Quote, I'm removing myself from ship talk completely. Threats have been made to 
myself, my wife, and my young children by Anna on Tumblr cowards on burner accounts. I realize that their extremes are not representative of that shit, but some of y'all are exhausting and I hope you find some positivity in your lives. Those who brought this up respectfully on my Insta, thanks for your passionate yet respectful messages. I feel I owed you a proper response. And obviously this whole incident reignited the sheath vs clance thing tenfold. Hilariously, Steven Yun was infamous for basically avoiding the fandom entirely, though this was likely because he was just an extremely busy Hollywood actor. I like to think it's because secretly he knew better than to get involved. The general fandom's entitlement grew to the point where mocking and harassing the crew became normalized and even came to be seen as something of a meme, with crew members being added to group chats where fans would hurl abuse at them or being subjected to joking posts about how fans wanted to hurt them. This all culminated in the infamous story of the glass cupcake incident. Legend has it that a fan who was angry that Clance wasn't made canon put shards of glass into cupcakes and handed them out to the crew, supposedly at some sort of fan event. Despite this being a super popular story within the fandom, there's actually no evidence that this ever happened. If you bring up Voltron drama online, you're bound to get mentions of this event, but looking online there are no tweets from crew members, no eyewitness accounts, no news articles, nothing. The general consensus by more knowledgeable fans is that this didn't happen, but the incident is still spread around to this day as a way to make clients shippers look bad or as a way to make the Voltron fandom in general look bad. Overall though, if harassment is so normalized in your fandom that people take a look at the story and think, yeah that probably happened, you have a problem. As this toxic attitude became more and more prevalent, fans found new and innovative ways to torture the cast and crew and harass them. A good example of this, and one that actually put the crew's jobs and livelihoods at stake, was the 2017 leaks. As I've said, obviously not all fans were acting like this, most people in the fandom were super chill, but there was that vocal minority who was hell-bent on making the crew's lives miserable. This culture of treating the crew like garbage culminated in an incident where a fan leaked confidential information about the show in order to blackmail the creators into making Clance canon. Let's start from the beginning though, the studio that drew an animated Voltron was called Studio Mer, situated in Seoul, South Korea. In 2017, Studio Mer conducted a tour of their studio where they had figurines, paintings, storyboards, character design sheets, unused sketches, and more behind the scenes artwork on display from their various shows. One attendee of this tour was a young Tumblr user and an aspiring animator who took photos of the various artwork, merch, and 3D models as the tour went along. When they got home, they compiled these images into six photo sets and posted them on Tumblr, where fans quickly discovered that these contained unreleased character designs and models from Voltron. As these leaks spread around, Studio Mer got in contact with the OP to let them know that taking photos on the tour, and especially posting them was strictly forbidden and while OP went into damage control trying to delete all of the reblogs and reposts, they adamantly stated that Studio Mer had never gotten them to sign an NDA and in fact encouraged them to take photos on the tour. It's hard to know who to believe, it seems crazy to me that Studio Mer would encourage photography of material that was likely under NDA but then maybe also the OP was just exaggerating things or lying. It's hard to know who was telling the truth in this situation. What we do know is that as the leak spread, Studio Mer became aware of it and began tweeting out asking for people to delete any infringing posts. They had gotten in serious trouble with DreamWorks for letting this information get out, especially with the allegations that they never made the OP sign an NDA and encouraged photography so they were on damage control trying to contain all of the leaks. This is where our blackmailer comes in, one Clance 14 In response to Studio Mer's tweets, they tweeted out, quote, Hi, make Clance canon and then I'll take them down from my Tumblr. Blogs not dedicated to Voltron also had the leaks. Once again, it's like with the voice actors, like, why the an- like, the animators don't write the show, what? Never mind, let's move on. Anyway, the entire fandom was up in arms. Some were spreading the leaks like wildfire to speculate and theorize over them, while others were writing PSAs to delete all the leaked posts out of fear that Studio Mill would be fired or Voltron would be cancelled altogether. The true identity of Clance One has been disputed. Some believe that they were a troll due to their account being new with no posts on it, while others believe they were genuinely a young kid who was overly invested in the fandom. Many lean towards the latter, given that other Twitter users were able to talk Clance One out of their blackmailing to 
the point that they recognized their mistakes and deleted all of their posts. That would be kind of strange and elaborate behavior for a troll, but it's hard to know. While other fans ran wild threatening the studio and spreading the leaks, news outlets got in on the drama spreading misinformation. Most of these articles made out that the OP who took the original pictures was Clance One and had the leaked photos stored away ready to release unless the studio agreed to their ransom demands. In reality, OP accidentally shared some classified photos from studio tour and quickly tried to take them down before they spread across the internet. Clance One, a separate user, then took the already leaked photos and made these empty threats quote unquote blackmailing the studio. There were already hundreds of reblogs and reposts all around Tumblr and Twitter so it's not like this one user had any leverage whatsoever. So definitely an incident that has been dramatized and taken out of proportion. As a side note, all of the sources I read on this topic had long rants peppered throughout about why clans shippers or sheath shippers were secretly behind all this and why they were the scum of the earth. What is clear is that news outlets have kind of twisted the story into some super secret espionage crazy hacker story when in reality it was an accidental leak spread by a bunch of 13 year olds. Thankfully as far as we know no one from Studio Mer was fired and the show continued on as planned. Although maybe at that point it would have been better for the show to have been cancelled because the final two seasons caused possibly the biggest fandom drama of them all. So I've avoided talking about the show itself for the most part, but it's kind of unavoidable to mention that well, most fans really hate what the show became. As the seasons went on, fans felt like the show was crashing and burning with dropped plots, nonsensical or no character development, and poor handling of the characters. Seasons 7 and 8 were by far the most controversial for a few primary reasons. In the lead up to season 7, a huge deal was made about the fact that Shiro would be revealed to be gay and in a relationship with a character called Adam, with interviews and marketing materials specifically designed to hype up this relationship and all the representation that came with it. However, when season 7 rolled around, Adam was only shown in a few brief scenes before quickly being killed off in a battle. The writers were accused of using the bury your gays trope where writers will add LGBTQ characters into their stories for brownie points often with little to no character development before quickly killing them off. This example seemed particularly egregious because of how much marketing material and general hype was made around this character who died almost as soon as he was introduced. Another huge point of contention was Lance getting together with Allura which dashed the hopes of clan shivers who at this point were unshakably convinced that the ship would be canon. Add to this the fact that Allura, the only woman of colour in the main cast, was killed off, notably the only main character in the cast to die. To add salt to the wound, in June of 2021, the official Voltron Instagram page posted a picture of Allura to celebrate Juneteenth. In response, Bex Taylor Claus commented, quote, Hmm, this is the only main black character. She is not from Earth and is the only main hero character to have died in the series. Might want to sit today out. Maybe repost some black made fan art or repost an info graphic made by black artists and activists about what Juneteenth really is. Hey PR team, feel free to text me so we can talk this out. These of course weren't the only issues that fans had with the final few seasons. There were many other issues ranging from poor treatment of disabled characters to fans feeling that the show was trying to pander to them to just overall poor writing. Whether you wholeheartedly agree with all of these points or think fans were making bad faith criticisms because their favourite ship didn't eventuate, you can't deny that the backlash to these final seasons was huge. And this isn't like a personal vendetta or an over-exaggeration or anything, you can find countless posts by fans trashing the show and what a garbage fire it was. So by the release of season 7, Clance still wasn't canon, the fandom had been queer baited, and basically everything was falling apart. So what exactly do you do when your favourite show ends up sucking? Well, just ask any Game of Thrones fan. But really, most of the time you just move on with your life and accept that unfortunately not every TV show ends the way that you want it to end. Not the Voltron fandom though. Instead, they formulated an entire alternate canon in an attempt to remake the entirety of Voltron. It started with one fan tweeting about a new Voltron AU or alternate universe that they had created set in a futuristic cyberpunk setting. In this reboot known as Voltron Defenders of Tomorrow, Clance was canon but it wasn't called Clance anymore. They renamed Keith to Akira, his name in the Japanese original, and Lance to Leandro which fans had canoned as his quote real Cuban name. Together their ship name was Lee Kira and while the details of this fan reboot varied from person to person, Lee Kira 
was always canon. Also, Shira was named after a dog for some reason. I don't know what that was about. Clance fans left adrift and helpless after the release of season 7 quickly clung on to Defenders of Tomorrow, proclaiming it as the one true canon. While many saw it for what it was, just a fun AU, as it gained popularity, more and more fans unironically believed that they would be making this into a real thing. It even got to the point where fans were in talks about making a Kickstarter to fund the reboot. In a cursed alternate timeline, this video is titled The $100,000 Voltron Scam Kickstarter. With Likira taking the fandom by storm and plans already being formulated to start funding this project, the creator had to swoop in. Quote, People keep DMing me asking how I'm gonna buy the rights to VLD. Guys, I'm in high school. For me, at least right now, Lee Kira is like an AU. Stop spreading that I'm buying Voltron or DreamWorks. I love how you can tell these were all like young kids in high school is spreading this because they were spreading rumors that this teenager was going to buy DreamWorks. Like, yeah, I'll sell my multi-trillion dollar company to a random Voltron fan on Twitter. Why the hell not? Anyway, the Lee Kira fandom was in full force. There were tons of fan blogs for it, floods of fan art, playlists, mood boards, fan fiction, you name it, and it seemed like the fandom was kind of having fun. But trouble was brewing because well, it's the Voltron fandom and literally everything had to be drama. Some fans felt that the Likira AU was disrespectful and rude to the showrunners as these fans were basically rewriting the show to their own liking. She fans were especially harsh on Likira as they felt that it was yet another example of clan shippers throwing a fit because they didn't get the ship that they wanted. They saw Likira as a thinly veiled way for spiteful clances to disrespect the showrunners and crew while Likira fans shot back that they were only having fun and Sheladins were trying to bully them for enjoying a simple AU. You. Some people even taunted Lee Kira fans by saying that they would get sued by DreamWorks, which was a very strange and interesting interpretation of copyright and fair use law. There was also a lot of criticism of this AU because of the poorly handled diversity that many felt was shoehorned in for brownie points. Many white fans were called out for randomly picking and choosing ethnicities and sexualities at random for the characters without taking the time to properly portray any of these groups. For example, in some incarnations, Allura was a lesbian, which some felt was a move to get praise for representation while shoving her out of the way of the clan ship. Naima, an alien Thief was often headcanoned as Romani, playing into harmful stereotypes about Romani people, and of course you had Shiro being named after a dog. And you know what, after all of that warring and drama and strife, the rise and fall of the Defenders of Tomorrow AU happened literally within one week. Yeah, all of that drama happened like within the span of a week and then Defenders of Tomorrow basically phased out of existence. Other AUs would pop up and cause similar fandom scuffles, but by this point season 8 was rapidly approaching and attentions turned to that. And uh, yeah, with Allura's death Death and Shiro's marriage to a random never before seen character that the writers admitted was shoehorned in to please the fandom, fans were not impressed. There were many, many video essays and write-ups made about how terribly Voltron was written and what a garbage fire its ending was, and while obviously that's subjective, the disappointment and anger was palpable. A few scattered alternate AUs were made after the show finished, but nothing quite got to the level of Defenders of Tomorrow, and fans eventually moved on to other more active franchises like She-Ra. Sorry, I moved positions, I had to move out of that blinding light that was beaming on me. Regardless of whether you think Defenders of Tomorrow was a fun and innocent AU or a sneaky way for Clance fans to spite the showrunners, you gotta admit that these fans were dedicated. Overall, the Voltron fandom gained a negative reputation in fandom spaces for the normalization of bullying and harassment, various scandals, and an unhealthily intense attitude towards shipping. This negative reputation was shared among fans too. You can read plenty of accounts of fans outright leaving online spaces and communities because of how hostile and drama-filled they were. Especially for young people at the time, this online community based around a DreamWorks show for kids could be downright unsafe and a lot of ex-fans will testify to this. Does all of this make Voltron a bad fandom? Well, that's really up to your personal interpretation and experience, but in my opinion, I don't think so. Voltron, like all fandoms, had its very intense and radical circles, but it also had completely normal and chill fans who just wanted to share the show and have fun. Still, these tales from the Voltron fandom are grim examples of what can happen when a fandom gets too invested in a show or piece of media to the point where they cause more harm than good. If you were slash are in the fandom and I missed any stories or you have any personal stories, definitely leave a comment because I'd be really interested to know. Anyway, the moral is Tumblr, am I right? Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry about this beam of light that's been like descending on me the whole video. I 
just trying to move out of it towards the end but um it is kind of annoying but anyway thank you for watching i really appreciate it if you ever have any suggestions for video topics definitely let me know thank you so much to skillshare for sponsoring this video and i hope to see you in the next one bye thank you so much to my garfield overlords over on patreon sheriff whiskey lady cerebellum xavier araujo grip gunderson sophie skitter x17 chan simon kendall patelic dozo blint red meth the Furby Librarian, Missy Pendragon, Moth Them, Astrium Vortex, Joe Bradshaw, Jordan Nielsen, John Leach, Donald Charles Davey, Helm Hamburger Hand, Tyson, Gyro Over Troubled Water, Vampiric Misfit, Pom, Dana Homegardner, Arcantilus, Jesse Chisholm, Kerbicon, Charlie B, Brianna Robinson, Boysenberry Switchblade, Finley, and Agarafin. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you want to join these guys over on Patreon, head to the link in the description. Again, thank you guys so much for the support. It means the world to me and I really hope to see you in the next one. Bye!